and a very warm welcome to today's Enlight lecture event. Enlight. Hello, and a very warm welcome to today's Enlight lecture event. Enlight stands for European University Network to promote equitable quality of life, sustainability, and global engagement through higher education transformation. And it is a collaborative alliance of 10 universities from 10 European countries. My name is Vera Alexander, dialing in from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, and I will be moderating this session. Today's event is from the research focus area of culture and creativity, and the topic is Anthropocene and cultural shifts. Our plan is as follows. We will have four lecture pitches of 10 minutes each, followed by a shared discussion of about 10 to 15 minutes. For the discussion, you're all cordially invited to participate using the chat function. We will try to address as many questions and comments as we can. And please do take part. This entire project is about dialogue and also about communicating beyond the confines of university. So everybody is welcome to have a say, and this will be followed by a networking event. And now I have the pleasure of introducing to you our first speakers from the University of Tartu in Estonia, who are demonstrating their commitment to relationality by collaborating today. Marina Grishakova is a professor at the research group Narrative Culture Cognition at the Institute of Cultural Research, University of Tartu. She has been the coordinator of the Nordic Network of Narrative Studies and the European Network of Comparative Literary Studies. And currently she's a supervisor in the international research training group, Baltic Peripeties, Narratives of Reformations, Revolutions and Catastrophes. That encompasses the University of Greifswald, Tartu and Trondheim. She's also a co-promoter of the Chelsea project Refam, Refamiliarizing the Body and its Umwelt, coordinated by the University at Leuven. Her research interests include narrative studies, intermedial studies, and the semantics of culture. Sylvia Kur is a postdoctoral research assistant at the Institute of Cultural Research at the University of Tartu and a member of the research group Narrative, Culture and Cognition as well. She defended her doctoral dissertation titled Material Ekphrasis, bringing together new materialisms and ekphrastic studies in September 23. And she has published on the intermediate relations between literature, painting and film. Her research interests include intermedial studies, new materialisms and eco-criticism. And with that, I would like to hand over the mic to Marina and Silvia for their lecture titled The Pandemic as Kairos, Reimagining Relations with the Environment. Hello, everyone. We shall start sharing the screen. And Silvia will introduce our lecture. Yes, let us begin with a, a short introduction. Um, since the coronavirus outbreak, scholars in various fields, from biology and social sciences to philosophy and cultural studies, have turned their attention to the relationship between COVID-19 and the ecological crisis. Uh, and it has been explored in uh, different ways. COVID-19 has been studied as a symptom and product of the Anthropocene. For example, some scholars say that ecological changes facilitate transmissions of viruses. Another line of research deals with COVID-19 as an event that can perhaps prepare us for the next crisis. Um, for example, Bruno Latour asks, 
if we can view COVID-19 as a dress rehearsal for a global ecological collapse. And in this case, our familiar living conditions will be completely reoriented, and this orientation will be a, a big challenge to all of us. What is interesting is that uh, Latour doesn't claim it to be the case, but he explores it as a hypothesis, as a question, can we compare the two crises? Uh, some scholars also suggest that the COVID-19 crisis may be seen as a temporary break in our destructive activities. As we all know, COVID lockdowns cleared the sky and we discovered that we can live without unnecessary travel. Uh, and in this sense, the crisis can be an experimental space in which we can test how we can do, do things differently. And in our research, we were uh, interested in how um, such a disruptive event can provoke people to rethink their relations with the environment. We viewed the pandemic as Kairos, which means a critical moment that opens opportunities for choice, decision-making and change. So to illustrate the relations between the pandemic crisis and the ecological crisis, uh, we drew on the international study uh, Letters from the Future, coordinated by Anne Kessos and Yashar Sagai at the University of Twente, the Netherlands. Um, our research group participated in this study during the pandemic crisis. And the ecological issues turned out to be central in people's everyday imaginaries and uh, perceptions uh, of the future. The study was conducted by the consortium of scholars from different disciplines, uh, psychology, sociology, philosophy, in spring, autumn 2020. We collected 277 letters from 33 countries. The letter from the future is a creative exercise previously used in health promotion. Colleagues also used it in the study of voting preferences before and after the EU referendum in Greece. The letter writers were invited to imagine themselves traveling in time machine to the future and describing what the proximate environment uh, would look like, and but also the society at large. They produced short narratives uh, about the imagined future after the pandemic, and these imagining were, of course, also impacted by writers' uh, current concerns, fears, and hopes. The consortium studied different aspects of these letters, such as narrative models, anticipatory styles, politics of hope, and the findings were published in a special issue of the journal Futures. You can see the uh, reference uh, on our slide. Our research group focused on the changes in human perceptions of their environments and how the pandemic uh, impacted the everyday ways of emplacement, what kind of changes the letter writers anticipated in the future. And the research has shown that ecological issues were indeed at the center of these perceptions, manifesting in conflicts between the societal level of consumption and personal ecological choices, between planning and the local ways of emplacement, between the societal conceptualizations of nature and uh, personal sensibilities. We built our study on the distinctions uh, between space as abstract uh, and measurable and place as experienced, meaningful and constituted by everyday practices, interactions and feelings. In research literature, the emergence of place is seen as a result of the refining and transformative impact of sociality and civilization on nature. The recurrent practices and routines support the sense of stability, safety, and sociality. The fact that situated practices and forms of emplacement are in the long run time bound and unstable and changing is often ignored in contexts where uh, the stability appears as the norm. However, the large scale crises such as the pandemic disrupt the routines and they, re they reveal contingency and change at the core of seeming stability. Such events reintroduce temporality in the perception of place, disrupt the sense of 
stability, and reveal the uncanny and strange aspects of places. In the narrative analysis, we used uh, the concept of chronotope to capture uh, changes in the perception of places and the temporality of emplacement. This uh, concept uh, um, originates in literary studies and philosophy, but it was extended to anthropology, sociology, and linguistics. And the chronotope captures uh, the temporality of emplacement and reveals tacit taken for granted aspects of experience. We used, we discovered five recurrent or fre most frequent chronotopes uh, in our data, which are uh, the city and countryside, garden and home, the road and uh, the internet. So my colleague, uh, Sylvia Kuhl, would uh, now present our findings. So these are our most important findings. Uh, our analysis showed that uh, the pandemic was a critical moment, or we can say a Kairos moment, that provoked uh, intensified engagements with the environment. And in our analysis, we were particularly interested in how um, the five places are shaped by actions and feelings. On the one hand, we trace that um, some that there are some anthropocentric binaries in the imaginings of the future. For example, idyllic nature is often juxtaposed with technologically dominated civilization. And there is a clear split between the two. But on the other hand, in some of the letters, there is also a, a very interesting tendency to blur dichotomies, uh, particularly through the hybridization of places. Several writers describe environments that are flexible, hybrid, and polyfunctional. Uh, there is no clear boundary between the private and the public. And in some of the letters, um, there is also no separation between the city and the countryside. And later, we asked artificial intelligence to illustrate uh, these hybrid imaginings. You can see the picture on the left. Um, uh, in terms of emotional engagement, such imaginary places are characterized by uh, you can say, a naive belief in the bright future after the crisis. But what is important is that such hybrid imaginings challenge the binary of nature and culture, and these green urban places are shaped by new habits and practices. For example, inhabitants switch to local production and consumption, uh, which is more sustainable. Uh, some writers also stress the significance of communication challenges such as roads and the internet, and there is a general emphasis on sharing and interconnectedness. What is quite remarkable is that, is that uh, some places, for example, gardens, are shaped by collective actions, and this emphasis on collective practices involves thinking on a larger scale, where individual actions are multiplied to affect the environment globally. And this awareness of global interconnectedness prompts the ability to recognize the necessity to develop new collective habits. For example, one writer describes this new practice, which he calls uh, tree planting weekends. So people every weekend, people come together to plant trees. And this is a collective endeavor, which uh, serves to restore forestry. And another writer describes this newly developed practice of nursing bamboo. And this practice reshapes the environment as bamboo nurseries replace all uh, old agricultural and livestock farms. And these new collective habits, or we can say habitual acts of care for the environment, serve as the foundation of sustainability. Uh, thank you. These are our main findings. And here is the list of preferences. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much also for the excellent timekeeping. Thank you, Marina and Sylvia. Next up, we have Dr. Nessa Cronin. I think we need to wait for her to turn on the screen and maybe Marina and uh, Sylvia, you could stop sharing your slides so that Nessa can start hers. Nessa Cronin is an assistant professor in Irish studies at the Center for Irish Studies at the, Univers at the School of Geography, Archaeology and Irish Studies based at the University of Galway in Ireland. An interdisciplinary scholar with a background in philosophy and literature. 
She has published widely on various aspects of Irish literature, cultural geography, and socially engaged arts practices, investigating issues concerning place, language, translation, and identity in contemporary Irish and European cultures. Her recent work in environmental humanities has critically examined the role of humanities research and arts practices in addressing the pressing challenges of climate change and the loss of biodiversity. She has been the recipient of several awards from the Irish Research Council, Culture Ireland, and the European Science Foundation in recent years. And she's the vice chair of the Irish Humanities Alliance based at the Royal Irish Academy in Dublin. Nessa's talk today is titled Cultures of Climate Change, Place-Based Policy and Practice. The virtual floor, Nessa, okay. is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Briera, and thank you, Anna, as well, for having me today. Um, and also to say thank you to my colleagues in Galway, um, Pamela and Catherine, as well. Um, I've been on a few of these Enlight webinars before, and they're always a pleasure um, to learn from each other and to continue the conversations with our students and with our colleagues as well. Um, so today um, I'm going to look at the uh, the role um, and position of culture, primarily in sustainability uh, discourse and the discourse around the sustainability development goals as well. Um, so it's more maybe of a policy and practice uh, focus, but I'd be very excited to, to, do, to expand on this later, maybe in terms of teaching as well and how we teach this in the classroom um, in our discussion um, afterwards. Uh, most of the images I have here are from uh, Rena Pinel and Joe Lee, a reproduced with kind permission from a European Capital of Culture project that they ran in Galway in 2020. And I'll talk a little more about this title image that I have uh, later in, in the moment as well. Um, but first, a little bit about myself, as Vera's outlined, um, I am traditionally trained in, in philosophy and in literature, but in more recent years, I've taken a turn towards environmental humanities and concerns about cultural expressions of living in the Anthropocene, and in particular, the role of culture um, as a tool and as an agent of change as well. Um, so we will move on to the next slide. Um, so today I'm going to look at uh, three kind of key areas. First of all, just reminding ourselves of what the Sustainable Development Goals are and what their origins were. Uh, then I'm going to move very quickly to look at the role of culture in climate change, sustainability and SDG, SDG narratives and framings. Um, and then primarily then going to focus on the challenges to the existing frameworks. Uh, in particular, the role that culture and language and arts and humanities and social science scholarship can bring. Um, up until now, in many senses, people see this as either a science uh, based solution or a policy based solution. But I would argue that we need to have culture and language as part of the as part of our toolkit as well. Um, two areas that I think would be interesting to explore a little further on this, um, building on scholarship in other areas, is the importance of place-based research and learning, uh, and also the question of decolonizing policy, pedagogy and practice as well. Um, there's been several critiques of sustainability narratives coming from the global north and also the SDGs in instrumentalizing uh, individuals, uh, communities and practices in different ways that might not be necessarily um, helpful or, or have unintended consequences as well that we need to be mindful of. Uh, so many of you are already familiar, I'm sure, uh, but just to recap, the Sustainable Development Goals um, emerged originally, uh, origins of it from the Earth Summit in Rio um, from 1992, uh, developed then as the, the Millennium Development Goals that were then adapted and developed further uh, from that uh, up to 2000. And then the United Nations signed up with the SDGs uh, from 2015 with aims and goals um, and uh, targets to be set to be met by 2030 uh, on a, an intergovernmental uh, basis. Um, so sustainable development is often seen in terms of three pillars of sustainability. Um, we have the social, the environmental and the economic. Um, but however, there is often seen to be something missing, as people say, the science is in, but the action is just a little bit uh, too slow. So I would argue that one of the areas that's missing really is culture um, and that culture can help us 
imagine, think and feel what climate change and biodiversity loss might look, sound and feel like, and also ask us questions as to why or should this matter. Um, Alison Tickle, who's the CEO of the NGO Julie's Bicycle in Scotland, that helps cultural organisations and institutions move towards uh, net carbon and zero carbon emissions. And um, she argued when the COP26 uh, was in Glasgow, she said that no amount of data, science or technology can ever make us feel the world in the same way as art can. So art and culture can play a vital role uh, in all of this. So the role of culture and climate change uh, and narratives and framings um, up, up until quite recently, it's often been seen as how we, who are the we are, can save culture and cultural objects or artifacts from the impacts of climate change. Um, UNESCO policy reports have looked at this in terms of how to maintain and protect a world cultural heritage loss, concerns with damage to property and cultural institutions, so how to uh, get, you know, uh, museums, galleries, theatres, libraries, venues, etc., to net zero or carbon neutral venues. Um, and within this, the whole framing is that culture is traditionally seen as a passive actor that's objectified and it's quite limited in terms of its role. Uh, it's seen as something to be protected. Um, but I would argue that this there needs to be a shift in how we see culture uh, in, in, in this context. The IPCC in 2022 has indicated this, that culture is not just a, a communicator of science, but can also be an agent of change. Um, but I would also go further to see that it is a generator of knowledge and a connective thread from shared past to alternative futures. Um, and so I would encourage us to go back to a more expansive categorization of culture as per Raymond Williams in his wonderful book, uh, Key Words. So why is culture important? Um, I won't spend too much on this slide. There's a lot here, um, but uh, two scholars in the London School of Economics, uh, Eric Neumayer and Charles Jolie, um, have argued that without social sciences, humanities and arts, the goal of sustainability may never be reached. Um, and this is saying that the challenges to addressing climate change are social and cultural, as well as uh, technological and scientific as well. And there are many reasons for this in terms of culture as a driver, uh, an expression of the social norms and cultural practices, and how individuals and societies also have particular attachments to places and landscapes as well that might be seen to resistant to change, or also that are seen as holding heritages in particular ways that are under threat uh, with climate change that we need to be aware of. Um, so this is just one instance of an artist um, working uh, in tandem with uh, photo montages with Jo Lee. So this is uh, Rhea Nookney Nail. I've spoken a lot about her work before. Um, but this is an image of Galway uh, in 2050 under an extreme storm surge. Uh, these images were placed around different parts of Galway City. So it in places the, the future, a future possibility of Galway under climate change for a, a very specific audience and communicating it in terms of cultural heritage in a way that data and graphs and charts uh, perhaps cannot. Um, so therefore, in many ways, other people have also argued that culture should be seen as a key infrastructure. And in 2010, uh, it was advocated to be regarded as the fourth pillar of sustainable development by the UCLG. Um, in 2023, I was asked to contribute to Ireland's climate change assessment report in volume four, uh, realising the benefits of transition and transformation, um, looking at, uh, in particular, the role of culture in climate change. Um, and my argument here um, really is that culture can help bridge the policy gap between climate ambition and climate action uh, in terms that in terms of that it can help us connect with and critically imagine different ecological futures by enabling us to navigate and narrate solutions for the kind of nation we wish to, wish to build in the next 100 years and beyond. Um, Ireland has just gone through a recent centenary of its foundation, uh, it's from 1922, post-partition, um, and this policy report is looking at for the next 100 years of where Ireland will be, uh, not just on the island itself, but also vis-a-vis -vis Europe and on a planetary scale. So other challenges or considerations for sustainability and STG frameworks, again, foregrounding place-based research and policy, uh, and also taking into considerations uh, decolonizing pedagogies, practices and considerations as well. So just a few insights from this, and then um, I'll be finishing up shortly. So from an international context, uh, the Earth Charter uh, was set up and founded in 1997. It gained its consensus in UNESCO in Paris in 2000. 
Um, and it's often regarded by individuals as an alternative way of bringing uh, organisations and governments together to uh, have a more e equitable eco-social future as a kind of counterpoint to the SDGs in a sense. It has four key pillars, 16 principles with the aim of global interdependence, shared responsibility and a shared vision of hope and a call to action um, and it's often seen as a more socially inclusive um, agenda as well uh, by members from the global south. Um, from uh, an Irish and other context uh, from a colonial and decolonial context as well there is an increasing interest in a language of sustainability from uh, decolonial or post-colonial cultures and also the connections between languages and biodiversity loss as those two things often go together. Um, again, I won't dwell too much on this, but just finally to say Kathleen Jamie, the Scottish poet, has written about this uh, from the perspective of Scotland, where she says, why is language important? And she writes, he who loses his language loses his world. So wrote the Gaelic poet Ian Crichton Smith, Ian McAgowan. One wonders if the converse is true. If one loses one world, one's world, as in with climate change, one loses one's language. The world of things, of making, of the land and animals and the stories and of the hands work. Um, so in an Irish context, uh, this uh, reached a particular point in recent years uh, when there was a, a Shell to Sea campaign launched by local communities uh, that saw their own the landscape and the marinescape of their area um, coming under uh, change uh, with the uh, development of gas refineries off the west coast of Ireland. Um, one of the individuals who was involved in the local protests, Mih Michal O'Shine, he foregrounded the role of culture and of language, that it wasn't just the environment that was going to be radically changed, but it's the role of culture. Uh, and he says, again, on a place-based element, our attachment to place comes into it too, According as we were going on bit by bit and learning more, it was more obvious that it was the end of the place, a summer to which the next generation could return, whether visiting or otherwise. This was the end of it. It wasn't just a matter of a new industry coming in, a gas refinery plant. That alone is no problem, but it would be the end of a millennia of culture. And he says, then, for us, the cultural aspect was very simple. When people talk about culture, it's a page in the Times that no one reads or the Sunday newspaper. But for us, it's a different thing. It's all of living everyday survival. Um, and this idea of culture is really, I think, the Raymond Williams idea of what culture is in its most expansive form, that it's all of living and everyday uh, survival. So uh, another example of this on a national basis, is the Burn Bio Trust, um, which is an organisation that develops research and best practice for community stewardship, place based learning, education and landscape management in Ireland. It has had an extraordinary uh, successful history in, uh, in sustainable management of community led projects uh, of high va natural value farmland um, in uh, South Galway and North County Clare. And in particular, um, its projects engaging with local and international communities has won uh, much accolade, uh, both nationally and internationally as well too. Um, finally, the, the, the image that I opened my talk with today uh, is an image um, from the Drowned Galway series by Rina Nail and Joe Lee. Um, and it's a kind of a, a, a counter image of the migrant crisis, the plastics crisis of the ocean um, uh, washing up on the shores of the west coast of Ireland. So it's juxtaposition of a very famous image of Galway here, the Spanish arch, um, and here uh, the images of two children washing up on the shoreline um, as part of the plastic that's being washed up on the ocean. It's an emplaced image and again having a very strong resonance to people that pass by and begin to look at the arch and look at the image and make the connections uh, between all of these things in a very much interrelational way um, that Marina and Sylvia just spoke of earlier. Um, so uh, Waldmuller and others have spoken about this uh, in terms of the need to decolonize the, the sustainable development goals and the, the, the concerns of the furthering of ep epistemic violence and also the danger of data. Um, we can discuss this perhaps uh, more in, in the chat as well. But in brief, they say in operationalizing the SDGs in a top down manner, they're arguing for a place based approach from national governments to local levels can be used for advancing goals contrary to sustainable development. And so they're arguing for more place based and local um, arguments uh, for, for that as well. So my final points uh, here are that we need to remind ourselves that the SDGs have a dynamic history and should not remain fixed. 
We have to remind ourselves of the role of culture and arts and humanities scholarship, scholarship in capturing cultural values and social mores that are really meaningful to people and societies. Um, and also to remind ourselves of bottom up and place based uh, practices and knowledges that can help co-create uh, knowledge and policy co-design for more sustainable futures uh, for all. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nessa. Uh, lots to talk about, as you say, and there will be an opportunity for that in the um, follow up discussion and um, event. I'm trying to multitask here and talk about things while starting my slides. I'm um, up next. I'm a senior lecturer and assistant professor at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. I work in European languages and cultures in the chair group cultures and literature. My research and teaching combines interdisciplinary perspectives from culture and politics and linguistics, um, mostly in English, but also in other languages. Um, I've published on life writing, eco-criticism, migration, travel, mobility, post-colonial issues, transcultural and diasporic literatures, and I'm currently working on garden narratives. Seems niche, but it's actually quite fundamental. Um, garden narratives as life writing, and in my work I investigate how human and more than human lives and growth intersect in the garden to help us overcome current crises of connection that have been mentioned already. In this context today, I will be talking about garden writing, more than human lives and transilience. Economists such as Sharma in this slide frame current challenges as the objective of infinite growth in a world of finite resources and call for a move from uh, what he calls ego systems to an eco system. Just putting on the timer here. Here we go. Um, or what Val Plumwood calls an environmental culture. We are in a panel on cultural shifts, but the question mark is, is enough shifting culturally? Because in a lot of environmental debates, we seem to be immobilized. This was written 20 years ago. It's just as true in 2024. We are, even though we have the means of addressing a lot of the problems, we are kind of stuck and do not move forward with an environmental culture that fully values and fully acknowledges non-human participants. Um, what Donna Haraway calls us living in times of the dithering, a state of indecisive agitation. We're nervous, but we're not moving forward. In order for cultural shifts to happen, or any kind of shift, any kind of learning process, I think, we need to motivate people to want to change. We need to go past scolding them, stop dithering, and um, to encourage the idea of growth and learning as something that we want. Um, so we need more than just different and new vocabularies of emerging trends. We also need things that move us to change. The cultural shifts needed can be um, addressed on various levels, thinking and communication, the, um, the way in which the environmental challenges have been framed of negative, we need a more optimistic framing. A lot of people feel overwhelmed. We need something that actually portrays that there is still hope. And we need something concrete to do. Um, something somewhere to start. So how we as a species relate to more than humans, to nature, as we call it, and to the concept of growth um, needs to change. And these changes need to encompass feeling, thinking, and doing. In my research, I'm looking for ways of formulating this kind of practical optimism, not a utopia, but ways in which we move forward. And in this research, I came across a very interesting term that captures a lot of these ideas, namely transilience. This has been coined and uh, developed by environmental psychologist Valentina Lozano Nasi. And this is a quality, a perceived capacity to persist, adapt flexibly, and to positively transform, transform in positive affirmative ways in face of such adversi adversities as are posed by climate change and other environmental challenges. So these three qualities 
um, of persistence, adaptability, or flexibility, and transformability are something that I find among other places in the garden. The garden is a familiar place to start. A lot of people know what we're talking about. Everybody can understand the concept of the garden. So the familiarity and the everyday nature of this space is important. And um, Marjorie Fish, who wrote about her first gardening steps in the 1950s, found, among other things, that when she planted small rock plants, they responded better when she put them into bad soil, uh, seemingly bad soil on hard surface. They responded better, she writes, to a little resistance. So this kind of attitude of responding well to resistance makes the garden a fun place, a familiar place for people to start thinking about ways in which we can thrive under pressure. And um, the garden not only models this um, in a way that we can visit and then leave, but um, psychologists in various um, areas and also other disciplines share that there are so many dimensions of how the garden actually infects us with this kind of quality. Because I'm not a botanist or biologist, I work with narratives. I turn to garden writings, what I call garden life writings. I've shown a few in these slides, so you know what I'm talking about, as the kind of writing that pioneers an environmental culture of transilience that pioneers the kind of um, positive development, the cultural shift that I believe we need. It shows how individuals overcome crises, personal crises, but also larger crises with the help of gardens and gardening. In the case of these slides, loss of creativity, grief, coping with cancer, there are countless illustrations, for instance, in uh, the book that is in the middle, The Well Garden Mind, a fantastic book by Sue Stewart Smith. All of these other books illustrate that um, contact with the garden, sometimes concrete forms of contact, such as horticultural therapy, have helped people overcome personal crises and in the process discover how nature, how plants, how various aspects of the garden, the community that was mentioned earlier, came towards them and co-created with them. So this wasn't just a matter of being cheered up by dealing with something green. This was also a matter of um, positive influences, finding more energy than people had, um, and finding a, a different way of um, formulating hope and going towards the future with a sense of, I don't have to do this on my own. There is actually all sorts of forces at work that help me, that help us, um, cope with the environment. So in other words, nature itself, it's, it's, it doesn't pat you on the shoulder as such, but there is a kind of reciprocity. All of these people, many of these people were not actually gardeners. They, were, they came to the garden and then wrote books about the experience because it turned out such to be such um, a fundamental um, moment of awakening and aha experience that you're not alone in the garden. There are little critters, you don't understand how it works, but in a way, um, moods change. Um, serotonin is released uh, in relation to uh, contact with certain bacteria, the scientists will tell us, but neuroscientists, um, such as the ones reported by Sue Stewart-Smith, tell us more about how this actually works in terms of how mental health is impacted. So these are people, this is just an illustration of how normal these uh, gardeners were. They were not actually gardeners to begin with, um, even uh, Stewart-Smith herself or Rosie Kinchin as a, yeah, the second quote, gardening never interested me. Uh, in fact, she thought of it as a kind of uh, chore. My research revolves around garden life writings and uh, seeks to recenter the garden as a space of care, as mentioned in the first talk, care and transilience. I make the argument that garden writings are life writings, but not just about human lives. They also show more than human lives and they show human and more than human relations as, as mutually transformative, mutually um, enriching and reciprocal. We're not just talking to ourselves in the garden. Um, these writings depict kinship with more than human lives and they help us understand ourselves as symbiotic beings that we are, as what uh, Robert Keegan um, 
calls embedules to go beyond the idea of the individual that has been so powerful from the environment uh, from the enlightenment onwards as the center of how we organize everything right embedules as as beings that actually need to be connected not just to other humans but also to other beings garden life writings model change most of these books that I showed you a moment ago arose from a personal crisis and the experience of overcoming this crisis. So these books model change and the experience of growth, garden growth and personal growth in familiar everyday sites. They also, and that is an important extra where we go beyond just going into the garden and starting to dig, they narrate the event, they reflect on this as a kind of co-creative experience. Writing the book is of course their creative experience and making the garden, designing the garden and, and putting things together. That is their creative experience. But there's also a sense of co-creativity with more than human lives. So, and, and these books um, explore the intersection between thinking, feeling and doing. At universities, we're all about the thinking. We're starting to open slightly to the feeling. We're not very good at taking the body on board. Um, with some artists that is much more advanced, but we need to open up to, to think about this as interconnected and necessary parts of our humanity. And Garden Writings pioneer an accessible environmental culture of care and more than human relationality, uh, depicting personal developments that illustrates the quality of um, transilience that I just mentioned. Um, as an illustration, I have this brief quote from uh, The Victory Garden for Trying Times by Debbie Goodwin. This is a book about her overcoming grief uh, upon losing her husband quite suddenly. She goes out into the garden the next day, I decided, um, she, she looks at a butterfly that lands near her, landed near me on the pink flowers of a sedum, one I'd never seen before. And it turns out to be called a morning cloak butterfly. Um, she later looks into why she feels so much better in the garden and uh, discovers that this is actually a, uh, a chemical reaction. Stuart Smith herself brings uh, up numerous examples of what happens, what kind of reciprocity happens when we cultivate the earth. So in a way, this um, confirms a lot of my findings and gives extra confirmation to this. When I presented some of this, and I'm wrapping up here, when I presented some of this to my students, they shrugged slightly saying, okay, gardens, well, you know what, we're not landed gentry, we don't have a garden. So for those who don't have that, um, and if you want to stay on YouTube a little bit longer, there is this fantastic channel called Prime Pays But Botany Doesn't. If you don't like profanity, you're not going to like this. But this is somebody who um, models a form of very well-informed guerrilla gardening of going about the United States, various locations and shining a critical light on the tensions between um, native plants and others. So there's a lot of different narratives out there, not necessarily printed books that um, are up for grabs and they are very inspiring in terms of what we are looking at. Okay, I'll leave it here. Thank you very much for your attention and your time. And I'm going to hand over in a moment, as soon as I've worked out how to stop this, I'm going to hand over to the last speaker in today's panel. I have the pleasure of introducing to you Professor Eric Massé, who is Professor of Sociology at the University of Bordeaux and currently Vice President in charge of environmental and societal transitions. Professor Massé specializes in power relations and culture, and he works on the historical transformation of social relations concerning gender, coloniality, and the Anthropocene. Today's lecture, which we start to see on the screen, uh, the, the lecture title states that in the Anthropocene context, a new interdisciplinarity is needed for sustainability science. We look forward to hearing your talk. So over to you, Eric. You need to unmute your microphone. Sorry, Eric, I don't think you're on yet. 
you need to unmute your microphone in the Zoom talk. The slides are fine. Okay, so, sorry, yeah. sorry. Thank you, Vera. Uh, so I will share my... Okay. Well, uh, is it okay? Um, do you hear me? Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, um, I, I'm a professor of, of sociology and the concept of Anthropocene has uh, been made from the science of uh, the Earth system. And it's the, the main difficulty for us is to connect um, the um, the meaning of uh, Anthropocene concept from the science of environmental science and uh, to uh, social science. And I discovered uh, as a um, as a vice president in charge of social and ecological transition in the University of Bordeaux, that the main difficulty, the main cultural difficulty uh, regarding the Anthropocene concept is, um, is a cultural shift. And I would add an epistemological shift or a cognitive shift um, regarding the way that Anthropocene uh, mean it's the entanglement between social and environmental uh, dimension and the capacity of uh, uh, science to answer to these very complex issues. So uh, uh, I will try uh, in the first time to, to just to illustrate the way uh, the Anthropocene concept blurs the boundaries between the physical uh, physical science, life science, and social sciences. Then I will show all, all these uh, issues or um, disrupts our cognitive framework or epistemological frameworks regarding time, space, and nature, which is a very uh, crucial issues to, to understand what's uh, uh, happened to us. And if I've got time, I'm not sure, I will show some example of all in the University of Bordeaux who try to, to face or to tackle those issues. So uh, it's, it's obvious that the Anthropocene in rules, the boundaries between the physical science, life science, and social science. And I will try to show it through uh, three, uh, three uh, historical uh, moments. Uh, present, past, and not future, but conditional. Um, at present, what's happening to us? Uh, of course, the answer is from the science of the um, uh, 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 Earth planet, uh, environmental science, climate science, and the, the need to find a new world. So Anthropos Kainos, which could be Anthropos Kairos, uh, as said Marina, uh, it means the, the historical moment of the planet uh, when uh, the, the, the human species, uh, when humanity is the main uh, cause of uh, uh, structural changes uh, at the level of the planet. So uh, if, we, if we traduce, if we translate uh, the concept, we can say that uh, we, we, we are in the Anthropocene era when the anthropogenic pressure threatens the critical living zone that humanity needs to survive, uh, we, we don't have to be to be afraid regarding the planet itself. Uh, the planet will be will survive to 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 humanity, but we have to be uh, to worry regarding the the, the humanity, and um, uh, there is some uh, evidence. Uh, to uh, to understand this uh, historical moment, and th that is uh, the, the the research and the result of all of colleagues, uh, specialists of environmental science, when they they show they, they demonstrated that uh, it's not only correlation between human action and the structural change at the planet level, but there is a strictly causality. 
uh, which is uh, the, the very meaning of Anthropocene, the moment of the human action is uh, able to, to change the, the, the structural, uh, uh, structural dimension of the planet. We have a lot of uh, uh, indicators and a lot of uh, e evidence that that uh, show that proves that uh, the Anthropocene moment is very, very specific, both in the history of the planet and in the history of the humanity. And uh, we we are able to show that um, if uh, we don't uh, find a, a, a solution, if we don't change the model. The, the the true issue is the the way if uh, there will be more uh, humanity in in the future or not so if we have to understand uh, how did we get here uh, we have to mobilize this time uh, not the environmental science but social science uh, there are uh, the science which are able to explain us that it was not a necessity to, uh, to, to go from anthropization, which is the normal way of humanity to adapt to, the, to, to, its, uh, to uh, its environment, to Anthropocene, which is another, uh, another um, historical moment. So we know that uh, since the 16th century, um, we, could, we could talk about capitalocene, uh, plantationocene, carbonocene, and so on. But we know that the starting point of the Anthropocene is the, 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 the Western modernity since the 16th century due to the uh, Western globalization through, uh, through colonization and so on. So, uh, and after the, the Industrial Revolution. So we know that uh, the Western modernity has tip precisely the balance of millennia old anthropization, which could, uh, could be a, a long story uh, without uh, Anthropocene, and towards the great acceleration of modern development and exponential anthropic pressure, which is the, 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 the very precise definition of Anthropocene. So we discovered that our uh, cognitive or epistemological matrix, which were uh, the modernity, we have to face the, 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 the issue that we have to face, the, we had to face, the world had to face the wave of modernization. And today we have to face the wave of the damage of progress. Uh, uh, um, so the, 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 the contemporary moment was inside modernity from the beginning, in, in a way. Uh, and, and all the uh, progress um, uh, um, contain uh, the, all the difficulties we know today, uh, uh, we have to face today. So conditional, uh, actually, we don't have to think that Anthropocene is a new geological era with a lot of time. Uh, it's only a, a moment and a very short moment because we are, uh, we are uh, uh, going outside Anthropocene at this moment. The, the, the ongoing exit from the Anthropocene uh, is, is, uh, is from, from today. And the question is, um, this exit, the ongoing exit, exit from the Anthropocene moment, will be uh, due to the human's action on in spite of, of the humans. Uh, actually, there is two ways to reduce modern anthropic pressure. Uh, the first way is due to the human capa cap uh, capabilities to change the, the model of developed uh, model of development. Uh, to uh, to uh, to lower some uh, some uh, uh, anthropic pressure to have a new kind of uh, relation with non-humans, a new kind of solidarity uh, within within humanity, and uh, it means uh, a, a, a radical change of uh, of the way of consumption, the way to to pro of production, 
the way of uh, the mobility, the way the things we eat. Uh, the, it's a huge change of, of model. Uh, our, uh, a new kind of low impact development. The other issue is, is the possibility that we, we will be not able to change our model because there is a huge path dependence and this path dependence makes impossible. Uh, to change or to change uh, in uh, in in time, which are uh, uh, com uh, in with a quick change that are needed. Maybe we can't have time to, uh, which is a paradox, to change uh, uh, in in a structural ways. So the issue is that the collapse of social ecosystems uh, will um, uh, will uh, threaten the, the the humanity itself so uh, if we want to illustrate uh, and, and i will finish the, uh, on this part if we want to illustrate the difficulties we have to make a new uh, interdisciplinarity to think uh, sustainability science uh, I, I i will i will show uh, very quickly uh, uh, all the interpersonal concept describes cognitive frameworks regarding time, space, and nature. <clears throat> if we think to time uh, uh, before the first, uh, the, 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 the first time, the, the, the temporary, which is which was more important, was the past. In the modernity, it was the future with an unlimited horizon of progress. And at the interpersonal moment, we know that the the, the only time we have is, we have is present. And present, which is uh, both uh, threatened by the consequences of the past and the, the, the thing we do or we are not able to do at the present, which is uh, threatened to our future. Racing to space, uh, the, there is a lot of, of change between uh, pre modernity and modernity, but the most important thing is, is to, to understand that. Uh, uh, we have we thought spaces uh, in the model of center periphery uh, with some outside, which could be uh, the nature, which could be the the space, which could be uh, other countries, and so on, uh, like something which were outside of us, and we have to know and to master or to conquer and to exploit. We know that we are in a world where there is no there is no more refuge, there is no more something which is outside due to the globalized boomerang defect. And regarding to nature, uh, it's well known that the, the great separation and hierarchization between humans and young humans, nature and cultural science and social science <clears throat> is no more a good way to, 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 to think. Uh, we have to, uh, because we are, there is a reversal of the force, modernity thought that uh, the human could be uh, uh, stronger than nature, and we have uh, today uh, the, the illustration every day on, uh, in every part of the world that there is a reversal of the force between humans and non-humans, between human unity and nature, and we we, we have to to measure that inter interdependency and vulnerabilities uh, is far away from the the, the notion of. Uh, uh, um, the, 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 the power, the, the, the empowerment of humanity regarding nature, which is uh, very more difficult today. Um, and uh, to, to, to finish, uh, just show uh, the way uh, at the University of Bolo, we try to, to, to tackle uh, this, uh, this uh, challenge to, to do a, a science uh, beyond, beyond the, the separation of uh, um, disciplinary boundaries and beyond interdisciplinarity regarding to a holistic approach to the interdependence and vulnerability of social ecosystems. And three projects very, uh, very quickly. Um, a, a first one, which we try to, 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 to make a cluster for sustainability science. It's not so easy to do. We had a lot of topics, we had a lot of issues and um, the paradox is the science is more impacted by the past dependence, and it's very it's very uh, uh, difficult to 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 go away. Okay, so we we have we try to manage on our campus like a, an experimental campus some living lamb who, 
we are able to 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 face some some uh, some issue uh, energy uh, water uh, lc uh, food supply and companies and so on and at the end we try to make a, a, a training for doctoral students in their capacity to to face uh, these uh, uh, issues regarding anthropocene that uh, uh, problem to to solve so it was very quick thank you for your attention thank you very much eric merci and as far as i understand we are now at the end of the pitches and ready for a discussion to begin and i believe the moderators the technical troubleshooters need to open the chat function for this um live stream in order for us to see what people or hear what people think as far as i can see right now the chat function is disabled but there is a time lag between what is on my screen here and on the other screen which is really interesting and so here we see it's maybe i just need to restart the page anyway um let's take a look so if anybody who has been listening to us has any questions or comments, um, we would now very much uh, like to hear what's on your minds. And um, as I said earlier, part of what we're doing in this Enlight series actually has to do with the fact that a lot of us are in different compartments and departments across Europe, across the world, working on very similar issues. And because we're all very busy, we don't have the time to find out what everybody else is doing. And it turns out that a lot of it is interesting and a lot of it overlaps. And um, the Enlight series is, is actually a very good and effective way of uh, bringing people together and helping us connect, overcome the um, crisis of connection that um, was mentioned in various iterations i i still seem to get uh, a message that there is no chat function but perhaps the troubleshooters can get into that while we wait for um the general public to join the debate is there anybody who has any questions in this virtual room nessa yeah go ahead Great. I uh, just say thank you so much. And um, I have taken loads of notes, so I will be following up with everybody afterwards. Um, it was really, really rich um, presentations and discussion. I have a question for Marina and Sylvia um, about your wonderful letters project. Um, and just to ask, you know, what was the personal response with students and individuals that you found most interesting or how did they find it helpful? Uh, so sorry, Nessa. Are you asking about um, uh, the distribution of questionnaires and surveys, or what, what was your question? Yeah, just in terms of the the letters project, in terms of the response from people, like what they found most interesting. Um, in in terms of. The, your analysis of 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 the project, um, and and I think your your chronotopes, your, the analysis of the of the chronotopes was really interesting, um, of the different sites that were paired, like road and the internet, gardens and home, city and country. Yeah, we we just didn't quite get what people, what kind of people, <laughs> uh, did you have in mind, uh, because uh, the. Uh, Research was conducted by the consortium, and we have uh, had the discussion within our research group. But we also shared our fi findings uh, on broadcasts or uh, newspapers and everywhere. We didn't have a broader discussion, but I, I guess there was uh, some local interest, uh, particularly in terms of. Uh, Chronotopic analysis, for example, the Estonian letters uh, showed uh, a clear interest in that chronotope of home. It was mm -hmm. amazing to 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 find that uh, in uh, twenty three letters, uh, home was mentioned more than thirty times, and uh, so the letters turned out to be 
particularly home centric, the Estonian letters. Mm -hmm. And also, Great. we have very interesting findings about gardens and uh, roads and the internet. We, we just didn't have uh, much time to present every detail, of course. Yeah. I, I was thinking it's a lovely link actually into Vera's project on garden writing and, and life writing, uh, a snapshot in a letter and a more extended one then through the, the creative nonfiction that that, that uh, Vera is looking at. So a really fascinating project. Um, I, I did a similar one with my students, but in a very personalised way during the uh, the end of the first lockdown where I got my first year students um, to write letters to um uh, to members, to people who were resident in nursing homes and care homes in the west of Ireland. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a big project that we did because we felt they were the two cohorts that were most severely affected by the lockdowns, uh, the teenagers and then the older generation. Um, and it was about that inter intergenerational connection. But again, as you were saying, home and actually windows appeared a lot uh, in those letters, looking out onto windows, looking out onto gardens. Because uh, many of the older residents were were actually were kept indoors as well. So a really wonderful project. Thank you for sharing that with us today. I'm glad you mentioned the uh, pandemic because, of course, that gave a huge boost to life writing in general. Mm -hmm. um, we're in a culture of selfies and self documentation, and and during the pandemic, people had time to reflect. And um, at least uh, one of the books I showed in my presentation is a lockdown project. Uh, mm -hmm. by a millennial who was scooped up and and missed her friends and everybody she knew was starting to have babies and that kind of life crisis led to an examination of um you know what was there and it turned out that gardening and gardens um and the form of nurture that arises there was quite central and i think care and and uh, other keywords that we've seen in a lot of talks are very yeah. Can I follow up on on your comment because I actually there are uh, because I wanted to ask you about um, uh, I was very curious uh, about uh, uh, the reason why those people we mentioned that uh, uh, many of them didn't know anything about gardens and weren't gardeners so I was uh, I was wondering uh, what was it that provoked uh, some of these writers to start this practice of care. Mm. Yeah, in some cases, it was quite an accidental thing. In the case of Debbie Goodwin, who I, who I mentioned, she started the garden in order to grow healthy food for her husband who was sick. And then he passed away very suddenly and, and the garden was left and reached out. Uh, in another case, um, a, a journalist who was suffering from postnatal depression was literally cast out into the um, green um, cordon around um, the city of London because she was cast out of her job because maternity still means being sent on maternity leave and being you know sort of forcefully uh, thrown out there's a great book by Lucy Jones Matrescence about just how you know sort of how much changes in the mother and, and how much doesn't change in society uh, quite annoyingly uh, where, where maternity is concerned so these life crises sometimes were um, literal events of people being ejected from the interiors that they were used to and the garden was would would receive them mm. and and in that sense it's it was a matter of accident and a lucky accident as most of them found mm -hmm. and it's an everyday space that you cannot uh, i mean you, mm. you pass by gardens as you went to your offices or wherever you went this went this morning they are that common and that's why it helps to defamiliarize spaces as common as these, because they mm -hmm. they are actually very reassuring and a good place to start. Speaking of starting, I think um, we are out of time and I don't see any chats in YouTube and I don't see anything in this chat of the in the Zoom chat chat. But there will be a networking event afterwards. So I think people who are inside this consortium are probably holding out to just have their microphones on and have a drink while talking about these issues. So unless there is something I've overlooked, in which case the organizers need to chip in and, and tell me to keep talking, I think we should just uh, call it a day and go to the other link which we've all been sent in some place and meet for the networking event. I would like to thank everybody who's here.
both uh, present in this moment and who is listening to us out there for your interest. As I said earlier, this is uh, the Anthropocene needs everybody. So um, the more people take an interest in this, the better for the planet and for all of us, humans and non-humans in the long run. So this is only the beginning of a discussion. If there are any questions or comments after this event, please feel free to contact us. And um, we're always happy to hear what's on people's minds. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you. I guess we should all give a wave and uh, mm -hmm. how this will end. <laughs> Happily. Bye. Bye-bye.